Well, now that we have some sense of our place in the universe, it's time to explore the question of life in the universe and where else in the universe we might be able to find people like us. Now, we've talked a little bit about life in general in terms of environments for habitable worlds and environments where microbes could live in our solar system and things of that nature. But today, I really want to focus on intelligent life, in other words, civilized, communicating, uh, advanced technological uh, life. Uh, assuming we are technologically advanced, uh, we are looking for people like us. So let's think about where we might find these folks and then imagine how we might calculate how frequently these civilizations might arise in our galaxy. So first of all, we have to start off by what we mean by habitable. Uh, I'm going to ignore the definition of life right now because we're just really since we only know of one intelligent species in the universe, us, uh, we assume we're looking for creatures that share our characteristics. So we're kind of leaving that question aside. Uh, but that means that the places where we're going to look have to be places where you can have advanced life forms. And as far as we know, the only places where you can have advanced life forms, such as us, is on a planet that has water. So we're going to focus this question around habitability and the habitable worlds uh, where you can have liquid water at the surface. So. Uh, just because a world is habitable doesn't necessarily mean it's inhabited or that it has life. It just means that it has this property where it's warm enough and it has a thick enough atmosphere that you can have liquid water at the surface. Uh, so this puts some constraints on what we can find. Uh, first of all, uh, the solar system, the stellar system, has to be old enough to allow evolution. Uh, in our solar system, we evolved uh, on a planet that's 4.55 billion years old. So what that means is, is that it took 4.55 billion years to evolve humans on this planet. Uh, if that is a common fact of life, that it just takes that long to get advanced uh, technologically uh, sophisticated beings, then 4.5 billion years is about the age of the stars that we need to look at. Uh, this rules out high mass stars. We can't have large mass stars. They're just too, uh, their lifetimes are too short. Uh, we need to have relatively stable orbits. Now what this means is, is that if you've got a uh, orbit that is uh, constantly f becoming more elliptical and less elliptical, or if it's, if it's, uh, if the axis is wobbling back and forth too much or something of that nature, uh, we can't, uh, we can't live there because the conditions will be too extreme. So this rules out maybe half of the star systems, because if you have binary multiple systems, you can really disturb the orbits of the planets. Uh, not in all cases, but in some cases. And then the size of this habitable zone um, is going to determine how much real estate we have uh, for uh, habitable worlds. So if you have a very high mass star, uh, then this habitable zone is further from the star, but it's bigger because uh, you can extend to a, a further distance away from the star. Or if you're a low mass star, you can be closer to the star, but you have a little bit less real estate because it, uh, the habitable zone doesn't extend uh, quite as far out uh, as it would for a larger star. But even if you take all these constraints into account, you still have something like billions of stars in the Milky Way that could effectively or essentially have life on them. Or I should say have planets around them that have life. So let's look at our habitable zones uh, for our solar system and then look at, uh, at stars of different masses. So the picture you see on the left here, uh, this is the habitable zone for our, our star system. This is the sun right here. And uh, very recent work puts the Earth right just inside the habitable zone. And my friend Ravi calculated out that the habitable zone is at 0.99 astronomical units. That's the inner edge of the, of the habitable zone. Uh, this out here is about 1.6 astronomical units. And Earth, so we're just barely inside the habitable zone of our star system. Venus is outside of it, therefore it's too hot. Mars is also inside the habitable zone, but it's pretty small and didn't hang on to an atmosphere. So its uh, temperature is a little cold uh, for, what, uh, for our conditions of habitability. Now, if I have a low mass star, maybe half the stellar mass, uh, the habitable zone moves in and shrinks a little bit. If I have a very low mass star, red dwarf, it gets very small. Now, you can have uh, planets in either of these habitable zones and you'll be fine, but you can see that there's less real estate uh, as we go to lower mass stars. However, low mass stars are very common in the galaxies, so it's entirely possible that these guys, even though they have the smallest habitable zone, may represent the most likely places to find, uh, to find life. 
Okay, so finding these things are going to be hard because remember we're looking for uh, Earth-like planets around stars. And just for an analogy, that's sort of like looking at a star. If you're standing on the east coast of the United States and you're looking at a star that's on the west coast of the United States, that would be the size of a grapefruit and the planet would be the size of a pinhead. So you can just imagine how difficult this is to do. We have the technology that we could easily see the pinhead uh, if that super bright star wasn't there shining, uh, shining light and, and blocking uh, our view of the, of the planet that surrounds it. Um, however, we are building technologies that can do this uh, using free-flying coronagraphs, and we talked about those before, where you can effectively block the light from the star and be able to see the planet. So within the next decade or so, I suspect we will have images of Earth-like planets around other stars. Okay. Uh, however, in the meantime, we don't have the technology to see these things, um, so we want to see if we can detect the technology that these civilizations are using. And one of the great ways to do that is to use radio telescopes, uh, because they can broadcast across the entire galaxy. So if there are any civilizations that use similar technology to us, we should be able to find them. Uh, but before we can go hunting for them, we have to ask the question, how frequent are they? Are they very common in the universe or are they very rare in the universe because that's going to drive our search strategy. So what I want to do now is talk about a method for estimating the uh, the number of intelligent species in the galaxy. And you had some practice in this in your homework where these uh, types of problems are called Fermi problems and Fermi problems are a way of estimating things that you in principle don't necessarily know uh, what the answer is going to be or even what some of the components are but you can make an educated guess about the certain components that lead up to a conclusion which at least gets you in the ballpark of what the right answer is. Uh, and you've done this before, right? If you've ever gone to uh, the fair and you see a big jar of jelly beans and there's a contest that says how many, asks you how many jelly Jelly beans are in the jar, uh, and you guess how many jelly beans you win the win the prize. Um, well, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could guess the number of jelly beans, just make up a number, or you could measure the jelly beans and estimate the volume of the jar and the volume of the jelly beans, and figure it out from. Uh, uh, from that uh, type of experiment. So uh, there are ways of, of making these estimations even if you can't physically count the number of jelly beans. And so I wanted to do an example of this for, uh, for Ogden, Utah to show you how powerful this technique can be uh, to look at uh, estimating something that we in principle don't know anything about. And the question we're going to an answer today is how many piano tuners are there in Ogden, Utah? Now this is something you could just look it up in the phone book, but let's take a moment before we do that and see if we can estimate how many they are just based on things we know about the town that we live in. Okay, so first of all we have to ask ourselves what things do we need to know and what types of estimates do we need to make. So it's probably going to depend on the number of people who happen to live in the city. It's probably going to depend on the number of uh, pianos that people have. And so you can write down all of these things and see if you can figure out what you need to know before you make any estimates. Uh, so this is uh, this is the estimate that I did for Ogden, Utah, and I just wrote down the questions that I wanted to ask myself to see if I could get to the number of piano tuners uh, in Ogden. So first of all, I had to write down the population of Ogden. It's about 83,000 people. That's the only thing I looked up just to, because I figured that was a, uh, in, in a number I needed to know. But I, if I had guessed, I would have said about 100,000 or about 70,000, something like that. Uh, now, I made the assumption that there are four people per family, so two, about 20,000 families uh, in Utah. And, uh, you know, just from my own personal experience, it seems to me like about a quarter of my friends have pianos, so I said about 25% of those families have a piano. So if we assume that these are very, you know, very uh, good piano owners and they want to have a nicely tuned piano, they tune their piano every single year. And if you do that, you can estimate the number of tunings that need to happen in a given year. So this number right here is just taking 80,000 and then I divide that by 4 because there's 4 people per family and then I multiply that by 0 0.25 because that's the number of people who have pianos and if I do that the number I get is about 5,000. So there are 5,000 pianos in the city of Ogden that need to be tuned every single year. So now I want to figure out, well, how many piano tuners do I need to do that? So if I think about the way a piano, piano tuner business might go, right, I figure a, a given piano tuner could probably tune four per day. And if we let them work 200 days a year, so they have some weekends and vacations, that's about 800 tuners or 800 pianos per tuner that can be tuned 
uh, by a given piano tuner uh, in the city of Ogden. So now all I have to do is take the number of tunings we need, divide it by the uh, number of tunings that a tuner can do in a year, and I get 6.25. So is that a, re a reasonable number? We'll check that in a second, but I just want to point out that you'll notice that all of these estimates I made by just guessing um, could be off by a factor of two or more, but they could only be off by a factor of two. It's not like you're going to say uh, there's a million people in Ogden. We know there's not a million people in Ogden, so it's got to be about 100,000 people. Uh, we, we're pretty sure that not everybody has a piano, so maybe half the people had a piano instead of 25%. But either way, these are only factors of two. So in, the, in, the, in, a, in sort of the, the ballpark estimate, we're going to be somewhere around six, almost regardless of what numbers we choose, as long as they're reasonable guesses for the right answer. So 6.25, I looked it up online, and there are six piano tuners in the Ogden area, which is crazy because that's exactly what I calculated. Now, it's not quite so crazy because if I was a person who wanted to start a piano tuning business, the first thing I would do is a market analysis of the city I wanted to operate in. And if I found out that they didn't have enough piano tuners, I would go to another city and try it there instead. So it's not surprising uh, that uh, the estimate for the number of piano tuners that are needed matches the number that happened to exist uh, in the city of Ogden. Uh, so that's an example of what's called a Fermi problem. And Fermi, Enrico Fermi, loved to do these sort of back of the envelope calculations. And we'll meet him again when we start talking about uh, finding life in the universe and trying to figure out where uh, all the aliens are. But a particular type of Fermi problem that you can use is one that lets you estimate the number of civilizations that we could potentially communicate with. And Frank Drake and Carl Sagan were the first two people to put this down on paper, and it's known as the Drake Equation uh, for Frank Drake. Uh, he was the lead author on, on uh, who uh, came up with this. And it's a way of estimating from first principles the number of civilizations in the galaxy, even if we don't know anything. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, break this down. So the Drake equation has a number of terms in it. The first term is this thing called NHP. This is the number of habitable, new habitable planets in the galaxy each year. So every year, some fraction of stars are born. Every year, some fraction of those stars have planets that, uh, that are formed around them. And every year, that means we have some new habitable planets that could evolve life. And so this is the number of habitable planets. This, in principle, is something we can measure, right? We can go out and observe the frequency of star formation, how many of them have uh, planets and things like that. So this is, I put this in one term that I would call observable, because we'll talk about in a minute that we're breaking this down into its different observable properties. But these things are pretty much just best estimates for properties of civilization. So let's look at those for a second. So if I take the number of new habitable worlds, I can say, well, some fraction of those are going to evolve life. Probably not all of them for one reason or another. So this can be a number between 0 and 1. And it can't be 0 because we're here, right? So if I made this 0, then the number of civilizations in the galaxy would be 0. But we know it has to be at least 1. So it could be some small number, uh, but it can't be any larger than 1 because that just means 100% of the planets uh, evolve life. Now, of those planets, some fraction of them uh, can be uh, evolve into intelligent civilizations, right? And again, this is some small number between, uh, could be small, could be one, right? If you say uh, life is frequent, then uh, all planets evolve life. You would have a one here. If you say intelligence is inevitable, then this would be one. And then if those people decide to communicate with anybody, then this could also be a number between 0 and 1. And if you assume that all intelligent species can want to communicate, this would be 1 as well. Uh, so all of these are, are fractional values that you have to just guess based on what you think the answer might be. Keeping in mind that they can't be any larger than 1, and they can't be 0 because there's at least one intelligent communicating civilization that exists in our galaxy. That's us. And then this last number here is the lifetime of civilizations. So this is the average uh, lifetime that you expect civilizations to live. Now, put this in perspective. I'm not talking about the lifetime of our species or the lifetime of life on Earth. I'm talking about the amount of time that humanity has been a communicating, intelligent, technologically advanced species. And for our civilization, this is only about 100 years because we didn't really start 
being able to communicate until we invented radio telescopes of the early part of the last century. So this is now 100 years and getting longer. Every day we wake up, our L gets bigger. But for our civilization right now, it's 100 years. Uh, for all I know, we'll live to be thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even millions of years. But for right now, we know that L is at least 100 uh, for our civilization. Now again, this is, has to represent, represent an average of all civilizations, so if most technologically advanced civilizations live much longer than 100 years, this number could be in principle very, very big. Okay, so let's break these things down. Let's look at NHP for a second because these are the observables, right? NHP is something that we can observe, and that is the Frac the number of stars that are born every year. So we can go out and look in the galaxy and say how many new stars are there. And this calculation is pretty pretty straightforward. All you have to do is basically take the um, number of stars in the galaxy and divide it by the age of the galaxy, and it gives you a number uh, that's about 10. Right? There are about 10 new stars per year in the galaxy. Now there have been more careful studies of this, really studying star formation, and the answer is about 10. Now, what fraction of those stars have planets? This is something that has been uh, studied very, very recently, and the, uh, the, the fraction of stars that have planets is looking like about all of the stars that we see uh, have planets. And so these things, this, this could be 100%. Um, uh, if you wanted to be conservative, you could say 50%, but this is something like 50 to 100%. Or, again, it has to be a number between 0 and 1. Since these are fractions, it's be 0 0.5 to 1.0. And then N sub E is the number of planets that happen to be in the habitable zone for a given system. Now, if you think about our solar system, we have two planets in the habitable zone. Only one of them evolved life. But that, you know, evolving life kind of takes place later here in this F sub L. So N for our solar system is actually 2. N sub E is two Earth-like planets in our solar system because Mars is in the habitable zone, Earth is in the habitable zone. Uh, in principle, that number could be much larger. There could be solar systems where there are five planets in the habitable zone. Uh, so that's something that we have to keep in mind. This this is an average. But even so, it's not going to be a hundred, and it's got to it could be uh, at least one, right? Could be zero, I suppose. Except again. We're here, so none of these things can be zero because this whole equation has to be greater than or equal to one because we're here. Okay, so now let's do some examples, right? If we've got some numbers that we've observed, uh, these are the numbers uh, that I'm going to be using. I'm going to say that our star, our star is about 10, um, FP is about 50%, and that we're going to take NE of for 2 for our solar system. And again, these are observed properties, sort of the, you can think of these as the concrete numbers. Now I have to make an estimate of F sub L, F sub I, and F sub C, which are uh, really just estimates. Uh, I can, I'm going to just have to make it up because I don't know what these things are. However, I am constrained. They can only be between 0 and 1 and I have to have at least one civilization, right? So I'm going to just make some estimates based on a couple of cases. We're going to say, uh, they're going to be optimistic and pessimistic and see what numbers come out to get a range. So if I take this all together, I already know what NHP is. That's going to be two or 10 new planets per year. So we have NHP is 10 new planets per year. Um, if I'm really optimistic and I could say, well, you know what, if you have a planet, in the habitable zone, life will evolve. That would be 0 1.0. .1, okay. Uh, now let's say pessimistic would be 10%, and I think 10% is probably pretty legitimate because I don't think that the evolution of life is terribly rare. I could be wrong about that, but let's just say for the sake of argument uh, that it's that 10% is pessimistic. Um, now, of the ones that evolve into intelligence, I could say an optimistic case would be, well, on Earth we had life and now we have intelligence, so that's uh, a 100% chance. Uh, or again, maybe 10% chance to be pessimistic. And F sub C is the number of communicating species. If you're intelligent, you probably like to communicate. So if you're optimistic, again, 1.0 or pessimistic, 0.1. And then it comes down to estimating the lifetime of the civilization in years. Now that, I'm going to leave that aside for a minute because that becomes a very important consideration. So let's take everything except for L and multiply all these things together. So I take my 
n sub p, which is 10, and in my pessimistic case I say 100% of the time we get life, 100% of the time we get intelligence, 100% of those communicate, and if I multiply that by L, this is my optimistic case is 10L. Pessimistic case do the exact same thing except I use my pessimistic values and I get 0.1L. So I have a factor of, what is that, a thousand difference between these two because I have uh, one zero point zero one L or 10 L. So these are my possibilities and you'll notice that it all depends on the lifetime of the civilization because the lifetime of the civilization is going to determine how long we are around and therefore how common civilizations are in the universe. So if we look at these numbers here if we take our L's, let's imagine that L is only 100 years. L is 100 years, we wipe ourselves off the face of the planet tomorrow in a global nuclear holocaust. No more technology on the planet Earth, and this is a common feature of civilizations. They burst up, they get technology, they invent the atom bomb, and then they wipe themselves off the face of the planet. That would mean that the average lifetime of civilizations is only 100 years, and if I put this into my optimistic and pessimistic cases, you'll note in the case of the pessimistic one, I only get one civilization at a time. That's us. Right? However, in my optimistic case, I have almost 1,000 civilizations, even if they're only lasting for 100 years. So depending on how you come down on these two different values, right, the optimistic or pessimistic, even if we wiped ourselves out tomorrow, we could be alone in the galaxy at the moment, or there could be thousands of us. Now again, just because we're alone at the moment, this just means there's one civilization in the galaxy at any one time. There could be civilizations popping up all the time, we just never see them because we've wiped ourselves out in a global nuclear holocaust. However, I don't think L is only 100 years. I suspect we're not going to wipe ourselves out tomorrow. We're probably going to last for quite some time uh, with our radio technology. So let's see what happens if we let L be a little bit bigger. Let's imagine L is a billion years. So once you evolve intelligent life in a solar system, it's basically going to live until the planet can no longer support life. That's going to be in about a billion years. So a billion years, if we imagine living a billion years, then I take my optimistic case. That means I've got 10 billion civilizations in the galaxy at any one time. But even in my pessimistic case, I have what is that? Um, I think I've got too many zeros on here. That says 1 billion. This should be, let's take two of these zeros off. This should be 0 0.01 times 1 billion. Yeah, so I take two of those zeros off. So I still have 10,000 civilizations, right? Did I get that right? No. That's a million. There we go. Ten million civilizations. Whew, thank you. Okay, so even in my least optimistic case, if we live for a billion years, I still have ten million civilizations in our, uh, in our galaxy. Uh, that's pretty amazing. So it, the, the key to finding intelligent life in the universe is how long-lived is it? Now, you could take a different take on this, and you could say, well, Let's say for the sake of argument that we won't live for a billion years because no civilization, no species has lived for a billion years. But you could take L to be, say, the average species time on the Earth. And if you, if you do that, most species live for millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of years. So if I put, say, L is 100 million instead of a billion, that's just a little bit lower. If L is 100 million, then if I multiply that by 10 in my pessimistic case, or my optimistic case, I get 10 uh, times 100 million, which means I get 1 billion. Or if I'm really, uh, this is my optimistic case, if I'm pessimistic, I get 0 0.1 times L, which is uh, 1 million. So even if, if you aren't living for a billion years, you still get some pretty impressive numbers of civilizations for the galaxy. Now, if you think about our galaxy, it has 100 billion stars, right? So that's a lot of room. And there's the nearest star to us is four light years away. And the nearest star 
after that that we would consider habitable is about 12 light years away. So the galaxy has a lot of space. So it's not surprising that even if there are huge numbers of civilizations in the galaxy that we may not have heard from them yet. We've only been listening for a few decades. And so if, and if there's a civilization that's broadcasting to us that's more than a few dozens or 20 light years away, we won't know about it yet. Okay, so if there's that many civilizations in the galaxy, the question is, where are they? And I'd like to frame this by pointing out that uh, we are the aliens who have already sent probes out into the universe. And we have sent probes that have left our solar system, just barely, but they have left our solar system. And I want to talk a little bit about the artifacts that exist uh, on those. Now this picture you're looking at here uh, was a plate that was attached to the Pioneer spacecraft in it, and, and it was an effort to kind of show the creatures that sent this. Uh, sent the spacecraft. And you can see it has a schematic representation of our solar system, including where the probe originated from. It has a uh, anatomically correct uh, just depiction of humans so we can see what we look like. It has the probe here so we can see how they can see how big we are compared to the probe. It has a hydrogen atom here uh, so that they know that we understand that this is the most common normal type of matter in the universe. And it also has our location of our sun referenced to a bunch of pulsars in our galaxy. So if somebody finds this plate, they'll know exactly where it came from. Now in addition to that, um, we've sent out more stuff, not only on the Pioneer spacecraft, but on Voyager spacecraft, and there's this great website called the Golden Record, which gives us a kind of a map of what uh, is on these probes that we sent out there. Now let's go ahead, this has a little interface here, maybe you can see this, if not you can go play with it later. Uh, you click on where we are in the galaxy and then it's going to pull up a picture of the Voyager spacecraft. And the Voyager spacecraft was sent out to study Jupiter and Saturn and then it just flew out of our solar system. And it's now just left the solar system. And on that, remember this was sent in the 70s and the technology of the time was the uh, long play uh, LP, the records, and we sent a golden disk that had inscribed on it all sorts of information including uh, a depiction of how to read it. So this was again, this was a golden record and so this is a, a graph of how to build a stylus that when you put it on the record the noise will come out or the data for the imagery would come out. Uh, it shows uh, how to play, how to build a device to play this. It again has that map of where we are in the galaxy. It has the hydrogen atom here and, and this hydrogen atom was put, it, put there uh, not only as a description of you know what we know about the universe but it also represents the frequency near where we listen for radio transmissions. So if somebody found this they could point a radio telescope at the Earth and try to get signals to us uh, at that frequency. And then we also sent, um, in addition to music and recordings, we sent uh, imagery and this is a uh, this is a graphical depiction of how you might decode the data on this disk uh, to turn it into an image. So if I go ahead and click on these guys I can explore what As the Secretary General of the sent. United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. Now you'll notice probably that they're not going to be English speaking, um, but however they will understand that that is some sort of communication and they won't necessarily be able to decode it, uh, but it, it, does, uh, it does have, that is out there in the galaxy right now. Now you can look, there's all sorts of things in here, um, sounds of Earth, they've got music in here. From all around the world. Let's find some. Here we go. That's out there in the galaxy right now. Chuck Berry's out in the galaxy. 
So this is the stuff we send out there. And this is crazy because we are the aliens. We put this artifact out there. Even if we wiped ourselves off the face of the planet tomorrow, that stuff is out there. Now, in addition to that, we also send imagery. And I just want, I'm not going to go through all these, but I just wanted to show you some of these things that, uh, that we sent out there. Um, again, the, the graph tells you something about decoding the image. Um, we sent a calibration circle that says, look, if you've decoded this image properly, you should see this circle. And you'll notice that that's also on the, um, it was on the, on the plate right behind it. So if they did it right, they would know they had the right answer because they should get this circle. Um, we sent them again our location of the solar system, some definitions of our mathematics, so to try and show them that you know if one dot was this symbol here, which is the number one as we write it in our language, so this was an effort to try and teach them some of our mathematical language so that they would understand what we're talking about. Uh, then once they have that, we can leverage this up to get to units, we can get to uh, scales of the solar system, we can get to properties of the solar system outer planets. Uh, we can send them pictures of the sun. And so we, we're trying to communicate this information to them in a way that in principle they could decode. Now, how long would it take them to do this? You know, if we, we have no idea what they're, what they're like and how long, it, but, uh, how long it would take them to do this, but we do capitalize on the fact that mathematics is the language of the universe. And if we understand math, they should understand the same math. So this is basically an astronomy class, right? We're showing them pictures of the planet Mars and Jupiter and Earth, right? And we show them properties of the Earth, different uh, things about chemistry, and we talk about our DNA structure, and we tell them a little bit about our biology and our anatomy, right? So we go on to some uh, to show them a lot of different things. Later on in this. Um, in this collection of images, we've got uh, pictures of families, and we have pictures of humans doing different things on the planet, recreation or labor, things like that. Uh, so this is a pretty cool website to explore just to find out uh, what's what we've already put out there. We've done that. Um, presumably other civilizations will have done it as well. And so uh, one of the ways to search for intelligent life would be to try to find evidence of artifacts uh, that are in uh, that are in the galaxy. Now this the chances of this thing ever being found are vanishingly small because it's just flying out in the middle of nowhere. It's not even really broadcasting a strong signal. But we did it because we thought it was important to make our mark and put it out there. Now on the other hand if we were to send a probe to a nearby galaxy uh, that would or sorry a nearby star system say Alpha Centauri that would orbit and take pictures of those planets then that probe would ultimately die because it would run out of power and it would just stay in orbit around the planet and any civilization that grew up there in principle could find it because they would see it orbiting their star so some people have suggested that if nearby star systems are more have civilizations more advanced than us that they may have already sent probes to study our solar system and that there may be probes in orbit around our star right now um, this is not as crazy of an idea as it sounds and people have looked for them we haven't found anything yet um, but it's entirely possible that there's something out there uh, and the reason i say that is because we've put stuff out there so unless we're completely alone in the universe i imagine that other civilizations have done that as well and it's important to remember for humanity that we've we have we're there is evidence that we have been here no matter what happens. There are rovers on the moon, there are rovers on Mars, we've got probes in orbit of all the outer planets, we've sent probes out of our solar system, and all of our television signals since the beginning of broadcast are flying out into space at the speed of light. All of that stuff is in principle detectable, and if there are other civilizations out there, they should see that, which means we should see stuff from them. So the question is, how are we going to do that? Uh, we wanted, I wanted to talk about uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, as a way of trying to find deliberate signals. Now, this is something where we have to uh, basically see a strong signal where somebody points its telescope at us, broadcasts a signal that we receive. Um, this is a little bit different than looking for inadvertent signals. We're not really looking for radio leakage or just kind of mistaken transmissions that weren't meant for us. This is looking for civilizations that are broadcasting continuously um, for, uh, uh, for to, to reach out. Um, now, 
The interesting thing about that is we don't broadcast continually to reach out. That's a very expensive proposition. Uh, so it's possible that not very many people do this. But, uh, but it's something that we can look for. We have the technology, so we might as well look for it. So we've been um, doing this for a while. We've even sent a couple of signals, uh, but uh, we haven't been doing it extensively or for very long. Uh, the SETI groups that got funded in the 70s and 80s, the funding got cut because people thought it was a waste of time to look for aliens. And so it, basically it's a privately funded uh, group that looks for these signals using as much scrounged up telescope time as they can find. Uh, now the reason we haven't sent very many signals is because sending signals is expensive and you have to ask where do you send the signal to. Uh, now something that's changed recently with the discovery of all of these new exoplanets is we now know where there are habitable worlds in the sky and so the notion of broadcasting to them uh, makes a little bit more sense now. Uh, so this is why, again, go back to uh, thinking about other civilizations out there. If there are other civilizations out there, they may already know that there's a habitable world around this star, and they may be broadcasting to us. So that's one of the reasons why we should continue to listen. Now, if you are interested in getting uh, and participating in this, you can help. So the data that comes down from these radio telescopes is enormous. We basically have to scan the entire sky every night looking for signals. And that means that there's just this stream of data coming in that has to be searched for artificial signals. And those artificial signals can be detected by you. So if you go to SETI at home, you can download the algorithm that processes these signals and you can run it as a screensaver uh, in the back of your um, in the back of your uh, computer when you're not using it. Whenever you don't use your computer, it pops up and runs these signals. You could be the first person to find an alien signal uh, if uh, if your computer happens to be the one that finds it. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Next time we're going to talk about the uh, the big question which is where the heck is everybody if there's supposedly hundreds of billions of people uh, or civilizations in the galaxy and hundreds of billions of places where stars could have habitable planets and yet we haven't found them uh, it really begs the question where are they and we'll talk about where they are next time